All right, well, thank you for everyone for coming on short, such short notice. <laughs> Thank you for coming. My name is Yvonne Pendleton. I'm the director of NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. That's a mouthful for a group of people that study the moon, near-Earth asteroids, and the moons of Mars. We try to bring together science and exploration. In other words, we try to answer the questions, the scientific questions, that one needs to know before you go to any of the destinations that NASA is considering to send humans to. So I'm very proud to be here today with one of the members of our team that is run out of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory uh, by An Dr. Andrew Rivkin. Uh, the person that I'm referring to, though, is Matt Siegler. He is a member of Andy's team, and he and his co-authors have just done a fabulous job writing a paper that is going to be embargoed until tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. So we encourage you to write about this, but not until after the embargo is listed, please, because he's too young in his career uh, <laughs> to have it go down the drain. Have nature be mad that, at me. Yeah, right, this is a paper going to nature, and they're, they're very, very um, explicit about that. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to just tell you that uh, the other speakers that we're going to have here today, besides Matt, Matt, by the way, is uh, at the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona, also affiliated with uh, Southern Methodist University. Uh, and besides uh, Matt, the first author of the paper, we have two of his co-authors. There are many authors on this paper, but the two that we have with us to answer your questions today and to speak to you are James Keene from the University of Arizona and Rich Miller, who is on the line here, from the University of Alabama at Huntsville. Thank you all for joining us, and I want to turn this over to Matt to tell you about uh, the fascinating story about how the lunar, um, the lunar polar ice is revealing that Earth's moon tilted on its axis many years ago. Matt. All right, thank you, Yvonne. And, and much like the Survey Institute, this paper was really a collaboration, and James and Rich um, are, you know, sort of almost equal co-authors on this paper to me, you know, that, that we really came up with this together as a team, and, and that's uh, sort of how it all came together. Um, so what we're going to talk today is a neat new finding we, we uh, discovered about the, the poles of the moon, actually using some old data, some new data, combining a lot of different data sets and a lot of different ways of thinking of the moon. Uh, in short, the finding is that we discovered that the interior evolution of the moon is actually recorded in the oddest of places in the ice at the poles. Okay, this is a surprising place where you would look to find out what's going on inside the moon. Um, but it turns out that the, the ice at the poles, because uh, just a little tilt will make all that ice sublimate away when you're in these polar shadowed craters near, near the north and south pole of the moon, um, a very small change in the spin axis of the moon uh, can cause ice to be completely lost. And what we're seeing, or what we believe we're seeing in the uh, poles of the moon, is that the, the distribution of ice at the north and south pole of the moon is actually best explained by what's called true polar wander, uh, which is results of a large change in mass in the lunar interior. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So for the brief overview, and uh, Rich and James are both going to talk about uh, the aspects of this paper that they really led. Uh, we'll go through this picture of the moon here. So essentially, the, the moon tilted by about five to six degrees um, due to this true polar wander. And it's recorded in the ice. Uh, what you could imagine is that once the moon may have looked like Mercury. All right? On Mercury, we find this body where we model where the ice should be. And on the moon, and, and everywhere on Mercury, it's there. But when we go and look at the moon, the ice isn't everywhere we expect it to be. It's only in a some of the places. A good explanation for this might be that the axis of the moon actually shifted by this five or six degrees that we're talking about, and all the rest of the other old ice was lost. And what we're seeing is the little residual that's left. So uh, with that 
introduction, maybe let's go to Rich and have him explain the actual uh, details of uh, the neutron spectrometer data that we found uh, to, to show this record. So why don't you go to the next slide and Rich is online, he'll talk. Sure. So at the top of this uh, page on the, on the left hand side, you see two polar plots for the north and south, which show the distribution of the hydrogen, which we believe is in the form of water, at frozen at the lunar poles. And this data was derived from um, neutron orbital geochemistry data that was taken in the late 90s by the Lunar Prospector mission. And a few years ago, these plots were actually made uh, a few years ago when my colleague David Lawrence and I developed a new technique that did a more robust statistical analysis on that, those distributions. And we were able to characterize not only the abundance of water and where it sits, but also how statistically relevant that result is, how much you should believe those distributions and the results you see at the top in the, those bluish plots. And the two, a, a, a couple points should uh, pop out at you. Unlike the Earth, um, that hydrogen or that water ice is not circumpolar, it's oddly shaped, something that was identified in the late 90s and early 2000s as well. Um, the maxima of those distributions are not associated with the current spin axis of the lunar poles. Um, if they were, they'd be right in the center. And those are denoted by the red dot and the black dot on each of those plots. And the abundances at each of the poles is roughly equivalent. And so it, it leads to a question that persisted for quite a while. Why do we have these odd, these odd distributions? And what my colleague Matt Siegler uh, had, a, had a good insight about was to pose the question, could this be due to the wander of the pole from a, a, what we call a paleopole, an old orientation of the moon, migrating to a new pole. And so we can analyze that in a couple ways. Um, on the right side of the, well, you can imagine if you took those two polar plots and you laid them on top of each other with the right transformations, if they were antipodal or pointed in opposite directions and they were identical, then it Oh, did we? And so we, we do that study, we do that study, and that's representative in the, in the bottom plot on the right-hand side. Um, so, Rich, um, you were cut off for just a second, so oh, um, why okay. don't you repeat the last little bit about the 180-degree the offset, explain sure. why you would So, if you took those two blue plots and you laid them on top of each other with the right transformations, if they were perfectly antipodal or pointed in opposite directions and were identical otherwise, then if you rotated them by 180 degrees, they would be a perfect match. And so we can do this test. We can evaluate how that hypothesis, whether that's reasonable or not. And that's summarized in the bottom plot on the left hand, on the right hand side. Um, what you see here, the vertical axis is related to the probability. And what we find is that as we rotate these two polar plots and test how similar they are, we get a very strong uh, suggestion of similarity when they're rotated by 180 degrees, which is We try this with other measures, whether it be, is it, is it cutting out? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it's cutting out. Rich, would you mind if in the interest of clarity for the audience, maybe Matt could explain this part? I'll try again. Uh, okay. If we try this with other measures like temperature distributions or water stability, we don't see this same type of distribution. and it's only the hydrogen that seems to point in opposite directions. So that tells there's, there's something very, very unique about this water ice distribution. And the water ice actually, at each pole, acts as an arrow pointing in a direction of the lunar tilt. 
I'll go over this very quickly, those orangey plots. Um, we also did these tests. Is it? It's not keeping up, is it? Can you hear me? We can, but it's having difficulty. It skips every once in a while. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to just go through explaining the orange plots then? And uh, Let me try one more time, okay. and then if it cuts out, I'll, I'll let you have it. So um, <laughs> <laughs> we can compare um, whether thermal distributions or the stability of the water using models that were derived by uh, Matt Siegler and compare that to the polar water distributions and they're not a very good match suggesting the current thermal environment is not a good match for this water ice distribution and, and uh, find is we get a better match with the thermal environment when we consider a thermal environment that's a mix of the current orientation of the moon and a previous orientation of the moon and that's represented by the bottom plots and so even without knowing the details of what those plots are you can see with your eye that the bottom two orange plots are a better match to those blue plots than this than the ones in the middle and this is strong evidence that we performed some robust statistics on strong evidence that there was a paleopole and that the moon migrated. So now we have evidence that the moon migrated and the water ice is an arrow at both poles telling us roughly what direction that migration was. And that leads to the work that James Keene did to figure out what was responsible for that reorientation. So I'll let James take it from there. Right, thank you, Rich. Okay, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the the uh, the hypothesis that uh, Matt and Rich came up with that the this hydrogen is retaining a paleopole that says something about the spin state of the moon. The spin of any planet, the moon, the Earth, is not arbitrary. Uh, it wants to spin in the minimum energy rotation state. It wants to conserve energy, and that only happens if it's spinning around what we call the maximum moment of inertia. Basically, it wants most of the mass to be down near the equator. Um, if we assume that the moon's paleopole, the moon had this paleopole, the lasers, um, <laughs> that says something about the distribution of mass at the time that that paleopole formed. And so using a combination of both GRAIL gravity data, a recent NASA mission to the moon that measured the gravity field to extraordinary precision, and uh, Apollo lunar laser reflect, reflecting data, we know the actual structure of the moon today and how it responds to reorientation. And so what these little blue contours, blue and orange contours show is where you can put a mass anomaly, uh, mass perturbance on the moon and change the moon's present day gravity state as measured by GRAIL and retro reflectors and put, move the spin pole from the present day pole to that paleo pole. So you can see right away that these sort of, these regions where you can put a mass anomaly are limited. You can't just put an anomaly anywhere on the moon to do this. Um, loosely, this, this hydrogen distribution creates almost a great circle that encompasses these contours. It's not quite because the moon's triaxial. It's not quite a spheroidal object. Um, but that's a good approximation to first order. And so what we do is you, you basically play this game of, well, what large geologic provinces lie in these contours or are centered in these contours that can cause this reorientation? In order for it to cause true polar one, it needs to be a big anomaly, a big density change. And really the only thing that lines up happens to be this region highlighted in pink and green that we call the Procalarum creep terrain. It's basically where you see all the dark Mari basalts when you look at the moon. It's the, the face in, on the moon. Uh, that region is centered right in one of these contours. Um, and it's a really interesting region. It's associated with all this volcanism. It's chemically distinct. Um, but more importantly for me, it's associated with a, a high temperature anomaly. Basically, it's hot. It had to melt at some point to create this volcanism. And that melting, that heat, creates a negative mass anomaly and actually drags the pole from this paleopole to the present day pole. And this is the only geologic feature that lines up with these contours. The only other large feature that could feasibly cause this 
would be a giant impact basin, but none of the moon's big impact basins, particularly South Pole Aiken on the far side, which you can't see here, doesn't fit in these contours. The only thing that works is this big giant basin. So I guess if we want to go to the next slide, we have a little animation that shows this polar wander with time. And before we get going, I want to explain it. Um, what we're doing here is we're combining uh, our work with the Paleopole with some thermal work studying the interior of the moon and its thermal history by Matthew Landview. Um, so this bottom plot will show the moon as it evolves. It's a temperature slice. So red will be hot. This yellow blue will be cold. Uh, and this is 4.5 billion years ago. And it will evolve through to today. And you'll see the plume, a plume form beneath the procolarum that will result in the reorientation. These top panels show different views of the moon. The first one is a view of the moon as you would see it from the Earth. Uh, we show the present day geology that's obviously not going to be there 4.5 billion years ago, but it gives a good reference. Um, the procol arm is this region uh, with all the mari basalts. These right plots show top down and bottom up views of the moon. And the little cyan blobs that you see here are the hydrogen contours. So you can see the hydrogen, the blue lines are the present day poles. So you can see that they're sort of associated with the cyan, but it's, it's not quite centered. That's this offset that we're talking about. And once we click play, basically we're going to let the moon evolve, and you'll see how the moon reorients. And so if we want to do click play somehow on this video. Um, the, if you just bring the arrow over the bottom of the slide. Okay, there. Yeah. So you'll see the PKT rapidly heats up, and the moon reorients. And as it's reorienting, the pole is leaving this white line to denote its path. And you see it very nicely flies right through this hydrogen. And then it eventually stabilizes at the present day pole. And it's important to note that all we did is we took the best thermal model of the procolarum and we stuck it on the procolarum. We put it where it's supposed to be. And that naturally produces this polar wonder path. There's no fine tuning here. Um, now, there are certainly other models that people can evoke to uh, create the procolarum, but this is sort of a general trend of most procolarum models. Um, and it's really interesting because, as Matt said, it's, it's linking polar volatiles to sort of a deep interior process. And so I guess with that, I'll jump back to Matt. Yeah, and so then this whole project is really neat in that we have the, the same angle, the same story attacked from different angles with very robust data. We have the neutrons having a strong antipolar correlation that, that Rich proved to 8.3 sigma. Okay, so that's a pretty powerful number. So Just thank to, you, Rich. To, let, want to quantify that a different way, the significance of the fact that the water at the poles point in opposite directions, this antipodal result which was key to this hypothesis, is that that could only happen one time out of 10 to the 15 by and so by random chance yeah. effectively this is not a random scenario this is highly significant and then we have the evidence that we have the thermal models which we can say okay here is where exactly you would predict ice to be given this past orientation and they match beautifully with the data and with that if we can tweak them right, we can even potentially say, okay, uh, ice seems to be associated with this pole, and as it moved, we got more ice at this time in the moon's history. So there's some real potential that if we could map the polar ice on the moon in even greater detail than what we have now, which is what uh, the LEND instrument is trying to do, and hopefully we will get all that data together to really get a robust story, um, that we can really uh, map when, so when the ice was delivered to the moon, as the moon moved. Um, and then there's this separate story that, as James was saying, if we just took this thermal model that, that Mathieu, uh, who's in the audience here, made up for us a few years ago, or he made up for his own separate project a few years ago, uh, we would have predicted this. So it's really neat that these separate lines of evidence have come together. Um, and that's, that's really the story behind the project, is many Different missions have come together here, uh, many different types of modeling, the, the search for the ice at the poles, the geophysics of the interior. Um, and so it's, it's really a neat story. And let's just go to the last slide to close on. 
I mean, so the, the big crux that I think is a neat story, and it's my bias because I stu study polar ice on the moon, <laughs> is that this offers a real strong explanation of the, the polar ice on the moon and why it is where it is and potentially when it got there. Right? We don't know because it's model dependent when exactly this wander moved, uh, but it happened sometime, you know, roughly three billion years ago. That's a fair? Yes. Okay. So if the ice is recording this motion, it has to probably predate that motion. And so now we're saying that the ice on the moon isn't a recent delivery from solar wind or a comet that hit the moon 100 million years ago. We're saying the bulk of the ice on the moon that we're seeing in the neutron spectrometer data is you know, greater than 3 billion years old. And that's a big claim. And it's something that we hope that future missions, such as the Resource Prospector mission led out of NASA Ames, um, can potentially give us answers to. If I may, just a couple of clarifications. Um, I, I agree generally with Matt. What it says is that uh, a, a significant fraction of the water at the poles is likely ancient, ancient as yeah. opposed to all or majority, just a significant fraction. And what fraction that is, that's an unknown. We need more details. And then just very briefly, um, to map this hydrogen in greater detail, will likely require future missions as opposed to current ongoing missions for various technical reasons. And so I, I, I just wanted to clarify that this picture is unlikely to be clarified um, with existing resources and will require future opportunities. Okay. Um, Can I add one thing? Sure, yeah. And I'd also like to clarify that I, I think um, I think it's also safe to say that there is OH and uh, other um, potentials for water forming in real time on the moon and other places, but, but you're saying That's the right. majority is at the poles of, of this ancient ice, but there is current on, ongoing. Yes, there's, there's um, strong evidence for a, a thin surface layer of water, uh, molecules thick over most of the moon, and especially in the near polar regions, uh, there's evidence for uh, as you get closer to the pole, you get smaller, little teeny micro cold traps that will fill with ice as you get nearer the pole. But as far as the bulk hydrogen that the neutron spectrometers are seeing, it appears to be you know, dominated by this older component, and you have some modern ice overlaying on that. So that's one of the neat things, too, is if this path is really showing us where the pole was through time, you might be, to, to be able to travel along it, you might be able to see the ice as it was delivered to the moon over its history. One of the critical things with future opportunities to do a better measurements of the water ice is really concerns the spatial resolution, and this really goes to your, your question. Right now, the spatial resolution of the, uh, these orbital geochemistry experiments that are detecting the water are limited to roughly 30 kilometer spatial scales. And in some cases, we know that that water is, is contained within permanently shadowed regions. In other cases, it's difficult to deconvolve that spatial distribution from localized shadowed craters and more broadly based distributions. And that's why we need future opportunities to improve that spatial resolution and, and resolve the fraction of recent hydrogen water de deposits which should be correlated with the current thermal environment and this more ancient distribution that might be more broadly distributed. Yeah, and then just to get in, so either the, you know, we're seeing a record, the ancient ice we're seeing is a record of ice that predated polar wander entirely, uh, or it could be ice that was delivered along the path, that large events brought ice to the moon as we traveled. That is another option. You could have had, you know, basically as the moon wandered along this path, you had a large input of ice, a giant comet hit the moon, a, uh, or you an could asteroid. have, yeah, or asteroid, or potentially even the outgassing from the interior of the moon itself, which a lot of people are finding is, is very water rich, could have actually brought the water to the poles.
Um, and then we have to admit, this is all could be a big coincidence. Uh, I think we have very strong evidence from very several angles that this is coming together, but who knows? It's always, <laughs> that's how science is. Um, with that, maybe we should head on to questions, and thank you all for listening. Thank you, uh, Matt and uh, James and Rich. Uh, yes, and I'd like to say that uh, uh, I really thank NASA for funding this research and for bringing these teams together. Uh, the Virtual Institute is a great model where this kind of cross-team collaboration can happen, cross-disciplinary uh, work, and the story of water on the moon is a fascinating one. Many of our teams are working on it from very various different angles, and I really, really am excited about it, and this work today is, uh, or that will be released tomorrow at 2 p.m. Is, uh, is really a great addition to uh, what we're learning about the moon. So I did remember I want to plug one other potential future mission since one of the heads of NASA is in the room here. <laughs> Could you go back just a couple slides? <laughs> um, essentially, what we're predicting in these models, yeah, so this is a good slide, um, is that in order for the current orientation of the moon to be as it is now and not at the ancient pole, we require that this mantle thermal anomaly still exists. That's a big claim. Um, and that is essentially saying that part of the mantle here is warmer than the surrounding mantle. And that's a subtlety that uh, the people that work on the GRAIL mission are telling me is a very difficult thing to eke out because these low order things will just look like a little bit of an offset of the core of the moon would give you the same solution. But what you can really do to test a, a setup, you know, to test the interior model like this of the moon is build a lunar geophysical network, a seismic network um, and a heat flow network that you can really map the interior of the moon. So that was another future mission idea that we wanted to plug that, that there are ways to really test this hypothesis and test what we're seeing. We'll just add one little bit, because we keep adding <laughs> things to your comments, is really, I think, the, to me, one of the most exciting parts of this has been that we've used data from almost every NASA mission to the moon since 1990. And we make predictions for every forthcoming or requested in the decadal survey mission to the moon, including both future lunar neutron spectrometers, like such as those that might be flown on CubeSats in the near future, um, to the Lunar Seismic Network, which was called Decadal Survey, to South Pole can sample return. It may not even, it may not be the most directly related, but constraining the timing of ancient basins also is very important for understanding this polar wander. So it's, to me, that's the exciting part is we're linking together all these things, all these different mission results, which is really Survey's goal. So uh, that's what's <laughs> exciting to, to and, and hopefully by throwing this paper out to the community, uh, other people can find their own ways to link their own research to it. So, thanks. Great. Any questions? By programs, are, are you talking about? Right, okay, well, that's, that's a wonderful softball question to me then for Survey. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we are, we're jointly funded from the Science Mission Directorate and the Exploration, uh, Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA. That's a wonderful bridge to build so that you're truly addressing the scientific questions that are not only interesting and important to basic research, but are very important for exploration if we're going to go beyond low Earth orbit. Yes. And so uh, so NASA has committed to this. We were, uh, Survey uh, followed on its predecessor virtual institute, which was called the NASA Lunar Science Institute, and that lasted uh, from 2008 to 13. Then Survey was born in 2013. They expanded our purview to include near-Earth asteroids and the moons of Mars as well as the moon. And so it is just ongoing. These are five-year 
funded teams. Each team has about 30 to 50 people in it. We have a network of about 300 researchers uh, across the U.S. 40% of those are young people, like James here, who are finishing their degrees and moving on into uh, their early career. So I think it's all setting this up for exactly this kind of project to continue, this kind of work I, to continue. I think I, if, I, if I can add, one of the nice things about survey, so, so many of us are involved in survey, um, including through the center at Johns Hopkins, survey and before that the Lunar Science Institute from a scientist perspective is it gives us the freedom to look at these broad-based questions in a very flexible way um, with these multi-year grants and this comprehensive set of teammates um, both within the survey program we have and, and, and finding collaborators outside it really allows us to tackle these science questions in fact questions that weren't originally part of the survey proposals and so that freedom and the speed with which we can study these comprehensive questions is really only possible with these kinds of programs that uh, enable that freedom and so I, I appreciate um, both the Lunar Science Institute when it existed and now the survey program. That's great. Thank you, Rich. So the, the water ice, um, we, we talk about bulk ice, but it's, uh, think of it as a dirty snowball. Um, if you were to go to the moon and grab roughly a kilogram of dirt, roughly one to three percent of that kilogram would be water. Uh, so we're not talking solid lakes or ice skating rinks. Uh, we're talking water, bulk water mixed in with the dirt in most of the places that we can identify. So, yeah. sorry, this is Emily Lockdewall from the Planetary Society. One of the things that I'm getting at is would the pre-existing uh, distribution of water ice that may have been, that may have lasted for a long time control where uh, water from that's bouncing around the moon might get trapped so that even though this is sort of a paleo distribution, you could still have a lot of water coming in later and it just gets trapped in the spots where there already was ice. I mean, so there's there's certainly the potential that you had ice there and it you know it somehow has modified the surface of the grain so that they're more sticky for modern water. There there's that that could be a possibility. Um, and there is a so uh, what we're saying generally is that we think this is uh, ice mixed in with the regolith. You can imagine if you took a block of ice and a block of regolith and let impact gardening beat them up for billions of years, you're going to get mixed down to very low concentrations of ice within within that regolith. Uh, the, the, the ice will get buried, it will get mixed together, and so that's what you're left in with the end picture. Um, there's also a chance, and uh, I'm not a fan of this chance, but uh, it could be that what we're seeing in the ancient hydrogen record is uh, hydrated mineralogy. That essentially, we it had to be ice at the time the pole moved, but sometime since then it could have somehow been locked in uh, in the form of hydrated minerals. And, and that's what we're seeing in this record here. Um, I don't like that because, as James has shown in his other work, there were previous episodes of polar wander, and we don't see hydrated mineral tracks from that. It's also unlikely to form an antipodal distribution that we see. Yeah, and then the Elcross mission strongly supports that uh, we have water ice in one of the locations we're saying there appears to be the highest concentration of water ice. So there's a lot of supporting evidence for uh, this material being water ice and just beaten up. And if we can then say, okay, three billion years ago before this transition the moon looked like mercury where ice was everywhere we expected we could have a model going forward let impact gardening do its job let polar wander boil away some of that ice uh, we could actually give you a strong prediction of how ice might look as a function of depth as well also another way to answer your question is that um, and, and Matt's really the expert on this, so I'll just prompt him and then he can answer in more detail, is that what really governs where the ice ends up 
and is stable <laughs> are, is the thermal environment. And what impacts the thermal environment is in part topography and also um, uh, exposure to um, uh, processes like the solar wind, space weathering, sunlight that can destroy or sublimate the hydrogen. And so it's really the thermal environment that dominates where the water is going to end up as it migrates to the poles. Yeah, I like to liken the ice at the poles to a vampire. <laughs> as soon as it hits any sunlight directly, it's going to poof away in a, in a puff of smoke. That's, that's literally what ice on the surface of the moon will do. Um, so what we're seeing here is the places where the sun don't shine and the sun never shined um, is, is really what we're seeing in, in this polar ice record. I think it's also, you mentioned the LCROSS satellite. I don't know if we could go back one more slide. Um, the LCROSS impact site is actually right at one of our paleo poles. Yep. So I think that's interesting that LCROSS found, it's not right at the paleo pole, but it's very close. And so while LCROSS is only sampling one region, so we can't really extrapolate it to the global or both poles and the global and the regional distribution, I think it's pretty suggestive that they found water ice very close to our pole. Yeah, virtually all the Apollo missions were right in this, right in this this area. Okay, so if that's the case, you have access to those samples, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have access to those samples and the composition of those basalts, can you get any data from those basalts to support your data now to correlate, you know, some of the data that you're that you're looking at now? Yeah, definitely. Uh, my wife's a geochemist, so okay. I know this <laughs> um, but yeah, we you can get the date uh, that that Mari was last, you know, that that was last liquid. Uh, you can you get get the temperature which it cooled. You know, there's lots of information you can get out of the material, and and especially out of isotopes of the material. Uh, one of the things that are, that's really new and novel now is by measuring uh, some of the other isotopes related without gassing, uh, chlorine and fluorine, and and these things. We're able to see that a lot of the Mari basalts may have as much as 1,000 ppm, was what I saw earlier this week reported, as um, of, of water. So that's a lot of water that isn't there now that did outgas at the time that, that those Mari erupted. So it's, it is a potential source for water on the moon, and I don't think that should be overlooked. In this region? Well, uh, should, should we tell them our crazy ideas? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll hold off on those for a little bit. Uh, no, I, I think one of, at least from my side, one of the um, important things is really to look in detail at the gravity signature of the Procolarum. There have been a number of studies, some about the Procolarum, that have been published by the Grail team. But uh, what we're predicting is, is sort of fundamentally different than what a lot of people would have expected. It's it's a very broad, potentially a very broad gravity anomaly. It's very hard to disentangle that. Grail's great at seeing really fine scale details, and there's a lot of good talks about that this week. Um, but in principle, the information regarding the reorientation is buried somewhere in that data. And so we're going through that now. Um, it, it, it's, it's, I know, <laughs> but it's, it's, they'll be, they'll be keen at all 2017 or something. <laughs> um, I bet you're right. I bet you're right. Andy Rivkin, the PI, the principal investigator for the Vortices team, which Matt is part of, has a question. Yeah, I'll, still, I'll, I'll make trouble anyway. So uh, <laughs> you've contrasted uh, the moon and Mercury several times. Okay. Uh, and so this may be more of a Mercury-related question. Uh, Mercury does not show this. Would you expect this, or is there a, nothing like the Procolarum that would cause polar wander? So we wouldn't get this, or does, is, is the, you know, would you speculate that the water was delivered to Mercury 
more recently? Or? There's no recent giant impact on Mercury that would explain a, a large-scale polar wander reorientation. But maybe this is that part's uh, better for James. Well, so there is some evidence in the gravity data that we have of Mercury, which is pretty limited from the Messenger mission, that uh, it's suggestive that Mercury has reoriented at least a little bit due to some of the bigger impacts, like Chloris. Those are very ancient, or at least we believe they're very ancient. Um, and so the problem is, is there's no big, this, the, the Procolarum is sort of a, almost a hemispheric, big, giant volcanic province. There's not anything really that comparable on, on Mercury. It certainly has a lot of volcanism, but it's all over the planet. It's not really localized. Um, and so if it's really just episodic small events, you would expect many polar wander paths, um, which we don't see or don't believe we see at Mercury, although we only have uh, good, well, no, I'm going to back away from what I was going to say. But, um, uh, and also, so I don't think that there's this sort of hem like asymmetric thermal uh, uh, effect that we see on the moon that's been shown in thermal models. Thermal models have been done in Mercury that don't, that don't uh, create this sort of anomaly. So I don't think there's a dynamical reason. But on top of it, there's just so much more ice at Mercury. And what we're seeing is a very subtle effect. And so maybe there are subtle effects that just are subtle polar wander paths in, in hydrogen um, or in buried ice that is not currently observed with Messenger. Um, unlike the Moon Messenger, is almost it is almost like ice skating rinks on in its poles. So, yeah. So I am a, a fan of the idea that the ice on Mercury might also be ancient from this hypothesis, but I'm not sure I'm in a majority or even a minority of more than one in that idea. But we'll we'll see what comes out over the next you know 10, 20 years of studying. <laughs> uh, let's see. Did we have another question? Emily. I'm wondering if, if the three of you on this panel attended the micro symposium this yes. weekend. And um, I didn't. And so at the risk of asking about work that's not yours, but what did you see there that had bearing on uh, what you're presenting today? Well, can I answer that first? As, okay. as somebody who's not part of this study, I was uh, struck by what Matt said earlier, the, the idea that our moon could have looked a lot like Mercury in the past. Uh, had this uh, tilt not occurred. I think I got that right. So if we had stayed in, at the axis, axial tilt that we had before, uh, we would have had a lot more water on our moon and it could have looked remarkably similar. So when it comes down to um, the water coming to Mercury in the moon or the water leaving, uh, the question was asked and, and the answer that came back was that it has to be um, in the removal uh, processes, that they both would have had the same essential delivery mechanisms or how are, they either got it because the water was there when they formed or it was delivered to them later. But uh, the, the key to why they're so different has to be in how it was removed. Did I get that? Sure, I, I wouldn't say that everyone agrees with that, as a, but, but I, I think that was a, a sentiment from a lot of talks that that was um, the another thing that came up a lot was the the release of water from all the materials on the moon. Uh, that was a recurring theme in a number of talks this weekend. Um, and then uh, another really interesting aspect is water isn't the only volatile involved in all this. There are lots of other volatile materials. Uh, on Mercury, we see this ubiquitous dark material that uh, my advisor Dave Page and I worked on a paper with uh, the lo uh, the MLA team. Uh, Greg Newman and associates that really discovered a new material other than ice in the cold traps on the pole of Mercury. So that's just a dark goo. We don't really know what it is, but things like this are a real mystery. And it's a mystery that we don't see that equivalent material on the moon. So that might be telling us something about the age, about the source, about how uh, water can stick around better than other volatiles for whatever reason, because it's a polar molecule or whatever. Um, so there's lots of interesting and dynamic comparisons between these two bodies, but um, it's definitely worth comparing them. And I, I personally found that a, a really exciting weekend. Yeah, I did too. Well, I wanted to, uh, to let you all know that uh, 
in addition to being just a hard-hitting scientist, I think Matt also has a great knack for these analogies that he comes up with. And uh, one of the things that came out in the press release, I don't know if you have seen it yet, but I wanted you to describe uh, what you were talking about, the face of the man in the moon. Oh. Yes, I just thought it was cute and then my He has so many analogies he has to think about. Yes. Yeah, the, in, in the video you saw of the evolution of the, uh, the face of the moon, I, uh, I was describing what, what happened with the moon as, you know, it, that currently we're used to seeing the same face of the moon, but in the past the face turned his nose up at the earth. Uh, is essentially was, yeah. <laughs> was the it's analogy I used there. Just turned his nose up. That the man on the moon turned his nose up at the earth. Because he had heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're going to remember. That is exactly the tagline. Bring in the gong now. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. We didn't even plan that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Thank you, Rich, for joining us. And, thank uh, you. And uh, James and Matt, and thank you all for coming. Um, look forward to uh, seeing what you write about this great paper that comes out tomorrow at 2 p.m. Not, not before. <laughs> all right, thank you.